All right. Last couple of lectures, we've been talking about how to take different uh, operations and make sure that they modify the database in a consistent way. We talked about what it means for a sequence of operations to be correct, and then we talked about one particular way of implementing, uh, of ensuring that these operations would uh, behave correctly, uh, specifically locking. Today we're going to take uh, a different approach to the same problem. So recall, our core goal, our core challenge, uh, was to make sure that uh, different transactions could execute at the same time. If you execute those transactions one at a time, uh, it's bad because it wastes resources. You spend time waiting for I.O., you spend time uh, you spend time uh, with multiprocessor systems uh, not allowing one, uh, not making use of your multiple processors, and in general, uh, you executing them one at a time also increases latency as well. Um, if we just allow the transactions to get interleaved entirely, uh, then that also creates a problem because now the transactions have to be aware of the fact that other transactions are running. Now locking is one way to give transactions the illusion that they're the only system uh, in, uh, that they're the only op uh, set of operations happening. It makes programming a lot easier. But what if we could give transactions the same illusion without actually asking them to do anything specific? And that's what we're going to talk, today, uh, talk about today, this idea that we can maintain that illusion that the transactions are doing, uh, that the transactions uh, are the only ones in the system, without actually uh, enforcing it, uh, at least not up front. Um, so recall, just uh, in terms of terminology, that a transaction, at least from the database's perspective, is a series of reads, a series of writes, and then either an abort statement uh, or the uh, commit statement at the very end. And what we'd like to preserve is this illusion that that transaction, that operation, is the only thing in the system. And if there's uh, some other entity sitting around in the, the system, then uh, at least from the perspective of... Uh, anyone seen... Uh, anyone know which movie this is from? Hmm? Yeah, Sherlock Holmes. Uh, so Watson here is... Uh, it, has anyone not seen the movie? I, I feel it's... All right, uh, spoilers? Okay. Um, all right, so basically the, the gist of it is uh, that Watson here thinks he's alone in the room, and uh, lo and behold, uh, Sherlock has uh, created a disguise for himself. Um, so, so far we've, we've talked about this pessimistic approach uh, to locking where, uh, to, to uh, ensuring, and again, uh, this kind of prevents the, uh, prevents the, uh, the, ex uh, the operations from uh, executing concurrently. Uh, here's a simple example of where locking is, a, uh, is not strictly speaking necessary. So you have one transaction that performs a write, performs uh, another write, then thinks for a really long time. Uh, maybe this uh, transaction uh, is uh, waiting for the user to say, OK, do it. Uh, this is maybe the, the transfer of, of uh, funds from one account to another. Um, and under uh, locking, this sequence of operations wouldn't be allowed because um, until transaction one actually commits, then transaction two can't actually uh, can't proceed because we don't know whether transaction one is going to, going to need to access A, B, or possibly access another uh, variable that could create a conflict later on. In other words, we can't predict the future. So uh, until transaction one actually says, OK, I'm done, we don't actually know what it's going to do. So we have to wait. Uh, we have to cause transaction to sit there uh, and wait until transaction one gets around to, to finishing. This is incredibly expensive. Uh, yeah? Could you uh, 
like a piece of recurring incident that happens like 75% of the time, but you make the assumption that uh, HP1 is actually going to be the core of could you make the assumption that T1 is going to commit before doing anything else? Um, that's an, that's, uh, that is a really good question. Um, and the answer is it depends. Um, so there, there's, there's two perspectives on this. Uh, and the, the pessimistic perspective is that well, I'll put it, uh, put it to you this way. Let's say that you make this assumption. Let's say that you assume that T1 does a right to A, right to B, and then uh, will eventually commit without doing anything else. What happens if you assume wrong? That's a really good question, though, because that's essentially what we want to do. We want to be able to... Uh, we want to be able to predict the future, but we can't. So how do we deal with the fact that we might guess wrong? Now, like I said, we can't predict the future until the transaction does whatever it's going to do. So why not just let the transaction do it? We have this, uh, at any point, the transaction could send us a message saying abort, at which point we're obliged to undo whatever it is the transaction wanted to do and, uh, and then either restart the transaction or, or let the transaction uh, continue however it wants. But the, the point is, at any point in the transaction, it could say, never mind, redo whatever it is that you wanted to do. So what if we just said, okay, let's let the transaction do whatever it is that it wants to do, check once it's ready to commit, check to see if, it's, uh, if, any, if it broke anything, and if it turns out that the transaction broke something, well, just pretend that the transaction actually aborted. And this is what's called optimistic concurrency control. We're optimistic because we're going to assume that we can predict the future. We're going to assume that nothing will go wrong. And we're going to allow each transaction to continue to execute as if nothing had go gone wrong, as if it was the only transaction uh, in the system. And then at the very end of the transaction, once everything is done, uh, we're going to uh, go through a validation step where we can ensure that the transaction didn't actually break anything. So to contrast, locking prevents us from getting into a bad situation, whereas optimistic concurrency control waits until the transaction is completed, then checks to see if the transaction uh, got into a bad situation uh, in the first place. Um, and then once we've made sure that the transaction is, uh, has done whatever it needs to do, uh, and whatever it did was, was safe, then we enter a serial uh, critical section, if you will, uh, where we actually make the, the operations, we reflect the operations to the rest of the world. Questions on the general idea or anything so far? That's a great question. So does optimistic concurrency control uh, save you that much time if you, need, uh, uh, if you need to validate or if you need to redo the transaction? If you have to redo it. And go through the process of checking whether or not you have to redo it. Okay, so does it save you that much uh, time if you need to go through the process of checking it? And does it save you that much time if you need to redo the transaction? Possibly. Um, that, those are both great, great questions. I'll answer them in reverse order. Um, so does it save you time if you have to go back and redo the transaction uh, entirely? No. Uh, but the assumption, uh, or the, the assumption that makes optimistic concurrency control work uh, is that nothing will go wrong. So if you have a, a lightly contested system, a system where there are uh, a number of transactions occurring at the same time, 
but those transactions aren't actually stepping on each other's toes, this works brilliantly because it doesn't require that the transactions uh, that the transactions wait on one another. Um, and uh, in the odd case where there is a problem, uh, after, you can still recover from it. And if a problem occurs one in every hundred times, uh, you know it's still going to be cheaper than uh, slowing everything down to, to wait for. Uh, slowing all of the, the transactions down to, to wait. Um, and this is one of those trade-offs. So locking, on the one hand, is good when you have lots and lots of contention, lots and lots of, of transactions trying to ac access the same set of data. Optimistic concurrency control is good when you can make this prediction, when you can guess that 99% of the time, uh, nothing will go wrong. Does that address your question? Oh, right, validation. Uh, so we're actually going to look at this. Um, the validation step does actually take a bit of time. Um, usually it will take less time than the rest of the transaction. And depending on how it's implemented, and we'll look at that a little bit, uh, you can actually make it go pretty, pretty quickly. Um, usually it involves a couple of set intersections, and those set intersections are about as big uh, uh, or essentially it has to check to see if any of the writes that it performed conflict with any of the uh, reads or writes that happened uh, while it was processing. Right? Same thing for reads. Uh, so that's a couple of set intersections, not super fast, but something that you can do, uh, something that you can check uh, in less time than the transaction will take to run in general. Okay, any other questions? Good question so far. All right, so uh, before we get into uh, the actual mechanics, I just want to introduce a little bit of terminology. Uh, so a, uh, a transaction is a, a sequence of reads and a sequence of, of writes. Um, we can basically talk about this entire, uh, the, the uh, the phase of the transaction where, back up, so uh, just to, to right, uh, terminology. So again, we're going to hit three, we're going to split the process up into three different phases. Uh, in the first phase, uh, which we call the read phase, the transaction is going to execute as if it were the only transaction in the system on a private copy of all of the uh, objects. This private copy, uh, uh, show of hands, uh, who's familiar with the term copy on write? Okay, uh, so essentially the idea is that uh, as long as the transaction doesn't actually change anything, you don't have to put any work to, to give it the, uh, put any additional work to give it the illusion that's working on a private copy. Um, essentially what I'm saying here is that uh, I'm, I'm saying that the transaction is executing on a private copy, but we can virtualize that copy and uh, essentially share most of the storage that, uh, that it needs. We don't actually have to copy uh, the entire database. We just have to kind of preserve the illusion that the, the transaction is working on a private copy. Uh, if you're interested, I can, I can go into further details on, on that uh, later on. But for now, just take my word that uh, the transaction can execute on a private copy of, of the database without actually incurring uh, a heavy expense. At any rate, the, the first phase uh, is going to be a read phase, uh, is, going, is known as the read phase, where the transaction executes on this virtual private copy. Uh, I know it's called the read phase, but the transaction is actually allowed to perform writes during, uh, during the read phase. Uh, the, the key thing is that those writes don't actually get reflected in the database itself. They just get reflected in this private uh, copy that, uh, that the transaction is, is working with. So the, the reads essentially get buffered. Uh, the validate phase, we're going to check for conflicts. And then finally, the write phase, the transaction has performed all of the modifications that it, uh, all of the writes that uh, it needs to do, and we're going to take those writes and actually put, uh, reflect them into the, uh, the actual database. Uh, you can think of the read phase, uh, if you want to look at this in terms of Git, 
Uh, the read phase is essentially that step where you're actually editing locally. And then the write phase is the git push. So you can still do writes to, to your files uh, during this, this initial edit phase, the read phase, uh, but they don't actually get reflected to your teammates until the write phase, at which point you can validate uh, also whether any uh, there were any conflicts. Okay, so let's look at the read phase, introduce a little more terminology. So I said a transaction from the database's perspective is an abort or commit uh, plus a set of reads and a set of writes. We need some way of uh, talking about the reads and the writes, so let's use the obvious terminology. Uh, we have a read set and a write set. Um, set of objects, and recall an object can be a cell, a, uh, a row, a table, or an entire block, uh, depending on uh, the level of granularity that we want to detect conflicts at. Um, just like we talked about at the end of last lecture. Uh, so the read set is the set of objects that uh, the transaction reads. Uh, the write set is the set of, trend, uh, of objects that the transaction writes. Uh, questions up to this point? All right. So we complete the, the read phase, the transaction does whatever it needs to do, and we come out of that uh, phase with a set of reads, a set of writes, and either, well, uh, if it aborts, well, we throw the transaction away, no harm, no foul. If it tries to commit, uh, we enter the validation phase. Uh, during the validation phase, we need some sort of serial order uh, to actually apply the transactions in. So before the validation phase starts, usually there will be some sort of atomic counter that uh, Will, that you'll, you'll assign a timestamp to the transaction. And uh, at, basically at that point, uh, the transaction either fails or succeeds depending on where it is in that timestamp order. So when we get down to it, during the validation phase, we need to be able to detect whether the transaction did anything silly, uh, anything that the other uh, that other trend uh, that conflicts with another transaction. So, what could we use to evaluate whether the transaction uh, is in conflict with uh, another transaction with a higher timestamp or with an earlier timestamp? Yeah. Uh, say again? So, you said that in the read phase, you write to certain objects that you're accessing, and multiple transactions are running to the same copies that were pointing to the same file. Okay, great. So, if we have two different objects, uh, sorry, if you, we have two different transactions, uh, it, and I understand you correctly, if they never access the same objects, then they're safe. Yeah. So, uh, if two transactions never access the same object, then, then we're good. Um, okay. What else? Uh, so that's kind of a... Okay. Um, what else could we use? So here's one simple test. We can mark the, the beginning and the end of the transaction and Let's say that we have one transaction that starts here, this point in time, ends here. And later on, we have another transaction that starts here and ends here. Will there be a conflict? No. This transaction finished. It did its read phase, 
it did its validation and it did its write entirely before this transaction even started, which means that when this transaction did its read phase, it was already reading everything that got written. So at this point, we're basically safe. Uh, now this helps us out a lot because it doesn't mean, uh, excuse me, it means that we don't actually need to keep a log of, the of every single transaction that has ever happened. We don't actually need to compare against every single transaction that has ever happened in all time. All we care about is the transactions that occur at the same time uh, that overlap in, in, in time. So essentially once once a transaction finishes, we only need to keep it around as long as there's another transaction uh, that was created while the first transaction was, uh, was running. It's a simple illustration. Uh, so if the first transaction finishes uh, before the second one starts, we're good. Uh, so let's, for each of these tests, ask ourselves two questions. Uh, first off, is this uh, sufficient to guarantee correctness? And in this case, pretty obvious answer, yes, that uh, there's no chance that these two transactions are going to conflict. Um, but is it efficient? Can we do better? Once again, the answer is yes. Okay, so let's start, let's start moving these transactions back a little bit. We have a read phase, we have a validate phase, and we have a write phase. We're interested in essentially figuring out how far back we can move a transaction, how far back we can move a, a second transaction uh, so that if it doesn't violate the, uh, if it's, uh, if the two transactions do actually end up accessing the same object, at what point can we essentially be sure that the two transactions are still not going to cause a conflict? Okay, so let's move things back a little bit. Let's say that we allow one of the transactions, uh, we allow the second transaction to start um, during the validation phase of the first transaction. Or at least to start before the write phase starts. So in other words, what happens when we allow the read phase to kind of move back, but allow the write phase of the first transaction to overlap with the, the read and or validate phase of, uh, of the second transaction? What would need to hold for this to be okay? Yeah. The first transaction can't write any values and the second one reads. Yep. So we're in danger of violating our big constraint here, but we're only, uh, we're only in danger of violating it between uh, the write phase and the read phase. So the second test, um, or the, the second level of granularity that we can go to, uh, if the read phase uh, if the read phase is, or sorry, if the read phase of the second transaction overlaps with the write phase or starts before the write phase of the second transaction, then at that point we need to do a little bit of a check. We need to check to see if the read and the write uh, don't conflict. Okay, sufficient 
Yes. If there's no overlapping uh, objects read and written, well, there's this write phase and this write phase uh, occur disjoint. Uh, this write phase completes entirely before this write phase. So if this write phase is going to overwrite anything, it's going to overwrite it correctly. Let's try pushing back even further. So what happens now when one write phase So now, what happens when the two write phases start overlapping? Okay, so now we need to make sure that the two write uh, if the two write phases are overlapping, then we need to make sure that the right phases are safe with respect to one another. <clears throat> Do we care about the two read phases overlapping? Nope. Read phases aren't doing anything, uh, aren't actually changing anything. So again, what we, care, uh, what we care about is the right phase of the first transaction overlapping with the read phase of the second, uh, and we care about the right phase of the first transaction overlapping uh, with the right phase of the second transaction. Can we avoid checking the right phase of this, uh, the, oh, actually, uh, we can avoid the, the right phases, uh, or the, the right phase in the, the reverse direction because, uh, oh, no, sorry, right phase, right phase, right phase, right phase. Uh, what about right phase or the second transaction conflicting with the read phase of the first transaction? Will that ever be a problem? Uh, that should be okay because it gets no. Yeah, so if there's a conflict between this write phase and this read phase, we've assigned this transaction an earlier timestamp. This transaction conceptually comes uh, now in, in our serial order uh, before this transaction. So we're actually expecting this transaction to read uh, from whatever happened first, and we're expecting this transaction uh, to, to uh, never write anything that this transaction can read. And the other thing is that because of the way that we assign the timestamp, uh, we always assign the timestamp um, after the read phase but before the validation phase, we're essentially guaranteed uh, that if the write phase for transaction three were to somehow start before the write phase for transaction two, transaction three would essentially come earlier in our serial order. We'd uh, that would basically mean that come up with a transaction four here. It's a really short read phase. Because transaction four here has a really short read and a really short validate phase. Um, it starts its write phase before transaction two's read phase finishes, which means there's some possibility that something that transaction two read was actually written to uh, by, by transaction four. But that's okay because we assign a timestamp immediately after the read phase finishes. So uh, with respect to our serial order, we'd end up with a transaction four coming conceptually or logically before transaction two. So in other words, what we'd be doing is comparing 
transaction two's read phase against transaction four's write phase, and we wouldn't be comparing transaction two's write phase. Uh, we would not be uh, comparing transaction two's write phase against transaction four's uh, read phase. And in effect, we kind of flip the order. Uh, we, we pick the order depending on uh, how they finish their uh, read phases. So, okay, if the, um, if the two write phases uh, overlap, we need to make sure that the two write phases are safe with one another, and we need to make sure that the read of one is, uh, doesn't overlap with the read of the other. So we have three tests. Uh, we have the test uh, that we use when uh, the two transactions aren't overlapping. We have the test uh, to see um, when the uh, rate phase and the read phase are overlapping. And we have the test to see uh, what to do when the write phases are overlapping. All right. Those seem like they're getting progressively more complex. In the first case, we didn't have to check for anything. No overlap whatsoever. Second case, we had to check for one set intersection. In the third case, we had to check for two set intersections. Should which one should we use? And if you're about to say it depends, then my response will be it depends on what. Yeah. Right. So we have three tests. But each of them tests uh, each of them um, tests for a different type of overlap. If the first type of overlap uh, doesn't work, we'll try the second type of overlap. If the second type of overlap doesn't work, we'll try for the third type. In other words, we'll we'll uh, we'll only do those set intersections that actually come from potentially conflicting uh, conflicting results. There are conflicting uh, transactions based on the transaction ID. So now there's a little bit of uh, an implementation issue here with respect to uh, validation, because the validation uh, step needs to um, the validation step needs a little bit of, of a critical section uh, to uh, pick a transaction ID or a timestamp uh, and actually perform the validation. During this uh, particular phase, we can't really do much else. Um, it's actually a typo. Um, the so the validation phase can take a little bit of time, and that's not. Uh, All right, ignore that. Um, OK, so so optimistic concurrency control, as, as we've described it uh, so far, um, is does have, uh, well, what do I say? So uh, optimistic con concurrency control, uh, as we've described it so far, um, works, again, by recording all of the reads and writes that a transaction performs. Running this validation step, um, there is this kind of messy uh, stage where we need to set, the, uh, set all of the, the writes uh, as being public. And this kind of messy critical section in the validation step where uh, things and kind of potentially break down. Also means that the transaction's rights don't actually get reflected until much later. Now this potentially causes a little bit of a problem. 
actually causes a little bit of a problem. Uh, so let's say we have transaction one. Does it read? Does a write? And then starts modifying a bunch of other objects. Meanwhile, we have another transaction that comes along and reads something that the first transaction modified. And moreover, let's say that that change to A only occurs at the very beginning of this transact of transaction one. Which means that ultimately at the very end, transaction two, this read operation is still safe. What would happen if we threw optimistic concurrency control at this problem? First off, what are what is our what are our read phases and write phases look like? Start off with a uh, read of A and then uh, write of A. Do a read of A here and then we do a read of B and a write to B. So once we hit the validation, uh, Once we hit the validation step, what's our read set for T1? What's our write set for T1? Read set is AB, and the write set is also AB. The read set here, A. And our transactions kind of look like this. So we've got uh, the read, <coughs> the read phase of transaction one overlapping with overlapping with uh, the right or coming before uh, the write phase of, of uh, transact the read phase of transaction two comes before the write phase of transaction one. Transaction two performs a read before transaction one has a chance to actually uh, reflect these writes, the A and the B, um, out into uh, out into the real world, the database. So, which of the three uh, which of the three tests do we need to check? The read and the write phase come before. What are the three tests, or what are the three three cases? What's the simplest case? No over, uh, case one, no overlap whatsoever. Is that the case here? No. Case two, what's case two? Checking to make sure transaction one's right does not overlap with transaction two's read. Two's, uh, other way around. So we're uh, checking to see if transaction two's right doesn't conflict with transaction one's read. 
So in other words, if transaction two's validation phase starts uh, starts after uh, transaction two uh, two's transaction one's uh, Backwards. If transaction two, there's no overlap between transaction. No, no, you're right, you're right, you're right. The transaction two's right phase and, and transaction one's uh, right phase. You're checking for uh, conflicts between the. The first is right and the second is right. Make this slightly more interesting. Okay. Now it's an interesting problem. Um, is that the case? So, uh, is that the case here, where you're trying to compare? Uh, say it again. So my thought was that if it was going to start testing if test two was the case, then it would check to see that test one's write on A does not conflict with test two's read on A, which I thought was test two. And now you've added a write, so... Oh, you're right, you're right, you're right, you're right. That is, that is my mistake. I'm uh, making this more complicated than it needs to be. Yeah, you're right. So checking to see if there's an overlap between the write and the read. Um, is that the case here? Or is that uh, an okay thing to do here? I don't think we would not use test two. Um, or if we use test two, it would be fine. Actually, test two and test three are equivalent here. Um, yeah. Because there's. But you're right. So what is test three? If you had that right in there, it would check to make sure the right's done. Oh, there is. Potentially a right phase is just going to be of zero size. And actually, yeah, the two right phases do conflict. So there's, uh, so we need to check to see if the right phases uh, conflict. We need to check to see if the read phases conflict. So set intersection between the empty set and, uh, and the right set of, of transaction one. That's nice and safe. What about? Uh, what about uh, the read sets? Should these transactions be allowed to commit? Yes, or I hear votes for yes. Why should they be allowed to commit? Yeah? T2 is not doing anything to A. It's not changing anything. It's not doing anything to A. Granted. Is it doing anything with A later on? Well, it's reading A. It's just reading A. Um, you can think of this as uh, a, a web form, or actually web forms are for, uh, perhaps a bad example. A web form at a bank. So we've got um, give everyone a raise, or sorry, give everyone $100, check to see if I've got $100, give everyone else $100. So given that sort of algorithm or the steps you take to see which test is going to uh, guarantee that it is a valid uh, set of transactions, mm -hmm. um, if test one is okay when you decide that transaction one completes all the way before transaction two starts, mm -hmm. then you don't need to check any further. But yep. if transaction two is okay, you still need to check to make sure that writes are um, I mean, not turn to the second test. Yes, so if, so again, you've got the three cases. You've got uh, the transactions have no overlap whatsoever. You've got the case where uh, there's a possible possibility of a read-write conflict. So there's some possibility that uh, transaction two reads something that hasn't been written to the, the database yet. And the third possibility uh, is that, as well as the possibility that the two 
uh, write operations may have gotten things out of order. So yeah, in this case, you check nothing. Uh, in this case, you check write versus read. And in this case, you check write, read, as well as write, write. Does that address your question? Yeah, I guess I don't understand why this type of test is even necessary. If, you're, if there's any overlap, you should be testing for write, read, and write, write. Um, not if the write operation of the, the last write operation finished after. So, uh, I'll give you an example. So, if uh, if we do the whole validation and, and write phase here, and then after that, we do a write to A, that's perfectly safe. Or equivalently, if this thing doesn't commit, it does a write here, uh, but just doesn't commit until much, much later, then again, we're, uh, the order is uh, is still case two. Basically, if the right phase, if one right phase completely finishes before the other right phase even starts, there's no chance that you're going to mess something up there. So you can save yourself a set intersection by uh, by just detecting time, uh, checking the timestamps. Okay. Um, Place for a really quick break. Um, but before we do that, uh, while we are in a break, um, I want you to think about two things. Uh, first off, is this okay from a conceptual standpoint, and is this okay from the perspective of optimistic concurrency control? And why or why not? So uh, be back here at uh, 125. In, so this is when you're trying to parse the SQL? Yeah. Oh, it looks like you might be trying to uh, read in the data file. As a SQL. Uh, so, what are where are you passing into on the command line? Uh, passing so the the data file it'll load automatically. Um, uh, so whatever you do to invoke Java, but then the command line argument. Are uh, data and then some directory. And then just the SQL files. Yeah. Um, it'll. The file scan operator essentially assumes that whatever. Uh, whatever data directory you have here, the uh, table name uh, 
the table name is going to uh, be the same name as a file in this directory with uh, the appropriate data. The, uh, in effect, this is telling you which file to load from this Right, so the players.dat is what it's doing is it's trying to read in the players.dat file as if it were a You don't need to pass, uh, so you need to. Yeah. So you, you need to tell it which directory the players.dat file is in, but you don't actually need to pass it in directly. So, uh, yeah, so dash dash data and then directory, and then the rest is just, uh, the rest is just secret. Oh, sorry. I just need to pass it Yeah. Okay, so now that should go in. So, yeah, here, I don't know what's going on. Like, yeah. It's like, that definitely... It's like like move like move dot moves mm -hmm. usually like not really nothing more than interlaced like two six fours and MP fours and then there's like a a capper that Apple kind of like throws out to say, Oh, this is our dot move file. You know? uh, so, yeah. so this is our proprietary thing. Um, I can export them in another format, but well, it's, that's what I'm doing. So it's just okay. it's taking me a little longer because I'm just running it through a converter okay. to like convert them into something else and so, then Basically, that uh, I mean, I I'm saying that like in the future, like the I can give you the raw file, but the raw file is this weird Sony specific format that I have only. I'm I'm sure uh, I'm sure uh, uh, Oh, so it doesn't. Oh, so you converted it first to a dot. Converted it to yeah. A dot. Oh, okay. well, because the um, basically what it does is. It, it just has this one ginormous file in some proprietary Sony format oh. that I'm sure. Uh, uh, I have no idea what the Adobe uh, product Premier. is. Premiere. Yeah. I'm sure Premiere can can read it. Uh, right. Because basically, what happens is like is like dot moves like they're not interlaced right. Like for whatever reason, like Premiere has a hard time with them, and like they end up like. It'll like it's doing it, it'll 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 like pull the well. What I was saying was like the H two six fours and the MP fours because that's really what it is. It's like basically like a, a mashup of those two types okay. that goes into a dot move. And okay. It's, and basically, what happens is it's like it's like audio is in the, under one and video is under another. And then what happens is when Premiere is trying to pull, when Premiere tries to pull them apart, okay, when you import into Premiere and tries to pull them apart, like Premiere will actually like it'll like get the video, like it always gets the video, but for whatever reason, like dot moves, like raw dot moves, it'll like the audio is trash. The audio is yeah, the audio uh, is gone. I mean, I I use the audio from you, the, right. I I figured that the audio off of that is probably what you want. Yeah. Anyway. Okay. But I I can next time I can dump just the entire. Uh, uh, I there's like this weird four gigabyte file that it just creates That's, and everything goes in there. Okay. Does it like does it like split it up like over the different one oh, file? Oh, it's just one gigantic. I, like I said, it, it's some proprietary, <laughs> funky proprietary format that uh, I I haven't been able to find an open source product that can read it, um, which is why. I've, Using iMovie because that's the only software I have that that will do it. Okay, off. Well, that, that makes sense. Yeah, I was just, I was just looking at this, so I'm just running everything through a converter to try to like make sure. Which maybe I won't even do because you're right, the audio is kind of rough off of that. Yeah, I think it's better audio track. Right. Question about ten or so. Uh, the leaderboard only shows the teams that have beaten the reference. Oh, so um, and what's the deal with the bacon? With the what? Was that serious? The bacon? Yeah. Uh, I make cheesecakes every so often, so next time I do, I'll uh, uh, okay. mini cheesecakes. So I'll send you a ping. Very cool. No extra credit, though. I think cheesecakes That's what I like to hear. All right. So. You've had a chance to think.
From a correctness standpoint, is it okay for me to accept this schedule? Is it okay for me to write the effects of T2 and be done with it? Why or why not? Nodding yes. Yes? No? I, I hear some, some indecision. Hey, yes, you said no. You said yes. Okay, why is it okay? It just looks right. Hmm? Uh, even forget that. Random question. What are you reading here? So T1 actually needs to commit A at the end of this transaction before you can read it. Yes. So from the perspective of optimistic concurrency control, think of this essentially as two different uh, uh, two different people both working on the same Git repository, but the push doesn't happen until here. So if I'm working on uh, on one repository, making changes to it, and then I push over here. Someone else reads from what's in the Git repository over here. What are they going to get back? Mutter, mutter. Uh, yeah, voices. The original. So. From a correctness standpoint, there's something funny going on here. We don't actually, this read under optimistic concurrency control isn't actually giving me the value that I'd get if I ran the <coughs> two blasts. But there was some intuition here. There's, we had some idea that this was potentially something I could permit. Why was that? Say the changes were actually getting reflected in the right place. We're using Google Docs rather than Git. In that case, would this be okay? Yeah. Yeah. You read from the right thing, and you never actually modify any afterwards, so you're perfectly safe. So. Uh, we've talked about locking, we've talked about optimistic concurrency control. Now let's talk about a third method called timestamp concurrency control. So the idea here is to allow these kinds of operations. Again, we're going to have a different type, uh, a different set of false positives, but we're going to allow a level of interleaving between transactions. Um, and we're actually going to allow them to modify the underlying database, but we're going to allow them to do this in a way so that they can kind of uh, detect when they're about to do something wrong. In effect, with uh, optimistic concurrency control, by not validating until the very, very end, you're essentially throwing away uh, a whole bunch of information about how the transactions are interleaved and whether the specific operation uh, causes a problem when the operation actually occurs. The way we're going to do this is for every single object, and again, object can be a cell, a row, a table, or the entire database, depending on the level of granularity that you care about. And we talked about the trade-offs uh, last class. Um, we're going to give each of these objects uh, a read timestamp and a write timestamp. And then for each of the transactions, we're also going to give them a timestamp. Uh, now the read timestamp, we're going to update that every time we perform a read. The write timestamp, we're going to update that every time we perform a write. And we're going to keep track of how uh, the current transactions timestamp uh, relates to, its, uh, to uh, the existing read and write timestamps in order to detect when we're about to do something that could potentially break uh, break serial uh, serializability. 
Let's look at these in turn. So when a transaction uh, reads from a given object, we're going to first check to see if another transaction, a later transaction, has already written to that object. So if the, the current write timestamp, remember, uh, we set the write, write timestamp uh, every time uh, we uh, write to it. So if uh, there's a later write timestamp, uh, then the object has been written to by a later transaction, which means what we're about to do, we're about to read from that value. That's a problem. We'll be reading the wrong value. So at that point, we're going to kill uh, the, the transaction, and we're going to restart it from scratch. On the other hand, if the right timestamp is earlier, then we're reading the correct value. And we're going to uh, update the read timestamp, uh, sorry, we're going to update the read timestamp uh, to the max of its current value and uh, the, the timestamp of the current transaction. Questions? So same thing happens. Uh, the same thing happens the other end. Uh, whenever we write to an object, we're going to first check to see if an earlier transaction, sorry, a, a later transaction has already read from that object. If a later transaction has already read from the object, well, we've we would be breaking the illusion that that op, that that transaction uh, is. Uh, isolated from the other transactions, the, so uh, we basically can't perform that right. We'll cause the, uh, the, transact the later transaction that already, read, read, that already read from that object to, uh, to have committed a dirty read. So once again, the current transaction, the one that's trying to write to the object, has to be aborted because there's no way it can proceed. Now, we also want to check the write timestamp because a later transaction might have performed a write to that object. But uh, because that later transaction has uh, already performed the write, it doesn't actually matter uh, what we're doing. Um, it doesn't actually matter. Uh, we can essentially proceed and just kind of hide the write, sweep the write under the rug because uh, another transaction has already conceptually overwritten us. Um, so we don't actually need to restart the entire transaction if there's a write-write conflict. We just ignore uh, the, we, we just kind of hide the write that uh, would never actually show up in the database. Random question. Yeah. Ah, so um, is there ever a case where there could be two writes at the same time? Um, so timestamp, I'm using the term timestamp, but I, I should be precise about this. What I mean is logical timestamp. So we're going to assign every single transaction uh, an increasing number. Transaction 1, transaction 2, transaction 3. Uh, transaction 2 comes along, performs a write on, uh, on A. Transaction 3 has already performed a write on, on A then in principle, transaction two is performing the right, but transaction three will, have, will later have overwritten that, uh, that right. Okay. Um, running a little bit low on time. So, okay. Um, right. So, yeah, we should talk about that. Okay. Um, so, let's say that you have uh, two transactions in the system. Um, 
one transaction performs a write and another transaction uh, reads from that write, then writes its own value, and then uh, performs a uh, commit. So T1 is kind of in this weird, ambiguous state at this point. Um, it is sitting there waiting, but it hasn't actually committed or aborted, which means if we want to consider all possibilities, if we want to make sure that everything is running correctly, then T1 could at any point abort. What happens at this point uh, with T2? So basically, the, the sequence of events that have occurred so far, T1 wrote to A, T2 read that value from A, and now wrote a separate value uh, to B. And T2 wants to commit. So first off, can we let this, uh, can we let T2 commit at this point? No, why? Because, say you that want, again? You don't want T2 to commit because of Brendan, a value that you Okay, so we can't allow T2 commit to commit because there's a possibility that T1 might abort. And if T1 aborts, then T2 read in the wrong value of A, which means that everything that T2 has done up to this point is suspect. And again, T2 might have completed correctly, but from our perspective, all we see is a bag of reads and a bag of writes. Uh, so from our perspective, there is a possibility that T2 uh, could have uh, done something incorrectly because we gave it the wrong value. So first off, we can't allow T2 uh, to commit. Um, what happens if T2, uh, what happens uh, if T1 aborts? Um, so now T1 has, right, uh, so T1 uh, at this point could abort, in which case the problem here is with T2. Um, because T2, when it does that read, doesn't actually know whether it should be reading uh, whether it should be reading from, from uh, the value that T1 wrote or whether it should be reading uh, from the original value. So a variant of timestamp concurrency uh, that combines it effectively with locking would be to uh, block all of the readers on a given object until the uh, original timestamp, uh, until the, the last uh, the last transaction that wrote to O uh, commits. And this is kind of analogous to just using exclusive locking. Okay. One last point I want to make here. And that's what happens if we reverse these two. So transaction two does its read and its write. Transaction one comes along and performs this read. So first off, would this be allowed if this was uh, timestamp one, timestamp two? No? Why not? T2 uh, didn't commit. Um, good point. Let's say it did. Would it still be allowed? Yes. T1 didn't want to read from the original. But 
So remember, with timestamp concurrency control, um, our mechanic for deciding which to, to uh, which value a transaction should read from is based on the timestamp. So in timestamp concurrency control, we're essentially assigning a serial order at the very beginning of the transaction. So here we've assigned uh, transaction one to come first and transaction two to come second. So here we're going to update the read timestamp of A. R T S of A become R T S of A and write. Uh, so here we're going to update the read timestamp to 2 because transaction 2 is reading from A. Here we're going to update the write timestamp to 2 because, again, transaction 2 is writing to A. And here we're going to have to check the write timestamp and figure out whether this is allowed, whether that uh, operation can conceptually, uh, whether uh, something that comes before transaction two can read from this value? The short answer is no. But we have, is there any way that we could rejigger the system somehow to allow this, to, to make it possible for um, let me raise that slightly. This will basically force us to restart transaction one. That could be potentially very expensive. So if we can do something to the system, we can uh, kind of find some way uh, to um, modify what's going on in such a way that, uh, or what, what is, uh, if we can find some way to allow this read to actually happen correctly, then we've saved ourselves a restart. And if transaction one is already done, <coughs> a lot of work, even before transaction two is completed, we can save ourselves a lot of effort. So, you're really running low on time. So I'm going to cut to the chase. Um, is there any way that we can avoid uh, these kinds of read after write conflicts? And the short version is yes. Um, in effect, what happened here is that we tried to do, uh, we overwrote uh, the, our copy of A. But there's nothing saying that we have to get rid of the old copy of A. Uh, we can, in practice, uh, keep around multiple versions of a given object. And so if we keep around the original version, the version as of timestamp, uh, before timestamp 2 and the version before timestamp 1, the version every timestamp, then we can still satisfy this read request without, uh, without uh, breaking, uh, we can satisfy that, that read request uh, correctly. Um, so, essentially, readers, uh, we do need to check the right timestamp to figure out which version of the object we need to go to. Um, but readers, listen, just doing a read will never cause the, the system to, to break. Um, right. So keep around older versions, and that's basically about it. So, uh, thanks everyone. See everyone on Tuesday.